created. Man, he makes hope in his own image. Since the beginning of time, evolution has been occurring because of forces beyond our control or comprehension. Until now, ours is the dawn of a new era. Man has begun to master the creation of life itself. Future generations will be genetically engineered to meet the requirements of a changing civilization. Death and disease may vanish. Technology, language, intellect, and society itself will grow unrecognizably different. In the world of tomorrow, man will grow ever closer to becoming the ultimate master of his fate. And so declares the full page advertisement in the September 1980 issue of Omni Magazine. I remember reading that as a freshman in college. I was a new Christian. I was shocked by it. I was just a young believer having come to Christ around 11th grade. What a statement. Man, the maker, man, the creator, man, the engineer, man, the conqueror, man, the victor, man, the ultimate master of his fate. Man, he makes hope in his own image. What a shocking statement. Man, I remember asking myself, what does God think about all of this? Where is God in such proud imaginations? Man is there boldly claiming to fashion hope in his own image. But what of God in whose image man was created? Why does man refuse to acknowledge his maker and sustainer? Why does he not honor God? Why doesn't he give thanks to God? Why does he refuse to acknowledge accountability to the one who formed him out of dust, who alone holds the power of life and death before whom man is only a puny bragger, a wayward rebel contending with God for his glory. Why, what does God think of the pride of man? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. Man the rebel, man the self-deceiver, man the self-proclaimer, man who shakes his fist at God and asserts his own autonomy, who creates this fictitious, self-centered, idolatrous world of his own imaginations. He attributes all of his achievements and his success to himself, but he charges God with being evil and unfair. Man sees evil in the world, but not in himself. He points the finger at God, but asserts his own innocence and greatness and goodness. And all the while amassing riches and comforts, he congratulates himself, but thinks not at all about the real giver of every good gift, the one in whom we live and move and exist. Sinners refuse to acknowledge that all prosperity comes from the Lord and from him alone. But how can we as Christians guard ourselves from a self-indulgent, idolatrous, dissatisfied, materialistic life? How can we stay humble and thankful before God? How can we rightly conduct ourselves in our relationship to the world in which we're only strangers and aliens? We're just pilgrims on our way to a heavenly city. How is the Christian to act with respect to our culture's things? their accumulation, their ownership? How should we set our priorities and lead our families and tend to our ambitions in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation? If you're not there already, turn with me please to Psalm 127. And I wanna uh, look to the word of God to teach us to the answers to those questions that I just asked. And here the psalmist speaks profoundly to the 21st century and especially to the church in America. Let's read together what he has to say 
I'm reading Psalm 127, verses 1 to 5 in the New American Standard Bible. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Profound words indeed, don't you agree? Five verses, and I get to preach them tonight, and how delighted I am. They fix our eyes on the Lord. They remove our eyes from ourselves. The psalmist exalts God the Lord. And he reminds us of this important fact. Listen, because it's our sermon title tonight. This is, this is what I'm preaching on. All prosperity comes from the Lord. All prosperity comes from the Lord. God and God alone. He gives success, wealth, blessing. God must provide or we have nothing. Yes, all prosperity comes from the Lord. And this brief song, Psalm 127, it focuses us tonight on God's blessing in three general spheres, as we'll see. And here's the first area that I want you to note tonight. It's letter A on our outline. A, the prosperity of family and state comes from the Lord. The prosperity of family and state comes from the Lord, verse 1. Now notice with me the psalm before us is entitled, A Song of Ascents. And if you look closely, you'll notice that Psalms 120 all the way to Psalm 134, 120 to 134, they all have this superscription. So there are 15 of them, and they're called Psalms of Ascent. That's the type of psalm that I picked for tonight. Psalm 127 is, in fact, the middle psalm of the 15 psalms, the songs or psalms of ascent. It is the first of six of these psalms to contain a beatitude. We'll see that in verse 5. Now, what is distinctive about the psalms of ascent? In the superscription, what does that mean? A song of ascents. Well, I got to tell you, various theories have been advanced to explain the title, and I believe the best one, most widely accepted, is that these were hymns that were sung by the Jewish worshipers going up to the temple on Mount Zion. And as these pilgrims made their annual trek for the religious festivals, they would sing these songs as they ascended up to Jerusalem. And of course, you ascend up to Jerusalem because it's located on a mount and it's up in the hilly country of Judah. So think about that. What a wonderful custom to sing and fix one's mind on eternal truths about God and his ways as you journey to worship him with all of his people. Wouldn't that make that a delightful journey and one that you would look forward to? Well, we also learn from the superscription that Solomon composed this psalm. It is the only one of the 15 psalms of ascent that he wrote, but Solomon also wrote, you remember, Psalm 72. And what does Solomon teach us in verse 1? That the prosperity of family and state comes from the Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. Now the first thing we want to understand is that building the house, as Luther pointed out, does not, he says, refer simply to the construction of walls and roof, rooms and chambers out of wood and stone. Rather, it refers to a household, a family, including wife, children, everything connected to a household and connected to raising a family. In Genesis 16, verse 2, in Genesis chapter 30, verse 3, build can mean to have or obtain children. And house can refer to a family. And you remember how Moses uses this term in Exodus chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, where the Lord established households for the Hebrew midwives who feared him. There's that other example where David wanted to build a house for the Lord, but the Lord instead promised to build David a house. You remember that? A family of descendants that would establish his throne 
forever, 2 Samuel 7, 16. So the Lord builds houses. We mean families, we mean households, descendants in a broader sense. He concerns himself with the household, the family, everything pertaining to household economy. Now then the progression of thought moves in verse one from family units and households to the whole city which they comprise. And further, the discussion of children in verses three to five supports this understanding of house in verse one. So Yahweh concerns himself with the building of households, families. Unless the Lord builds the house, the psalmist instructs, they labor in vain who build it. Solomon and Yahweh behind him want us to understand some deep and freeing and powerful truths for us, brothers and sisters, tonight. They affect our understanding of Christian marriage and the establishing and keeping of a family. And men, implications are especially directed toward you as a husband, as a provider, as the head of your household. Notice this word, unless, a conditional imperfect. It's a condition which must be met or certain results can be expected. The conditional clause, unless the Lord tells us something very profound. If God does not enter into our human affairs and give his blessing, well, we can be assured that all of our efforts will be wasted. They will be done in vain. They will certainly yield calamitous, disastrous results. Although the word vain comes from a different Hebrew root than the vanity of vanities in the book of Ecclesiastes, the concept is closely related. Futile, meaningless, that's the idea. Solomon is warning us, okay, go build your house without God, get a wife, get your job, settle into your neighborhood, raise your family, it will be in vain. It will be empty, futile, meaningless. And think with me, have you not experienced that perhaps in your own life? The best laid plans made without God produce disastrous homes, households in which the children never rise to the stature of their parents. I grew up, <laughs> you'll hear more about my family in a little bit, you would think, really? I grew up in a neighborhood of wealthy families. Um, we weren't. But the dentist down the hill, he raised his home without God. His children never lacked the necessities. They had the very best. But then they grew up and they brought so much grief to their parents. In fact, overall, our neighborhood was full of broken homes. I can't think of one that wasn't. Unfaithful husbands, shattered dreams, rebellious children, investments went bad, wives ran away. It was not a happy neighborhood. We did not know Christ. And those were my neighbors. Build your house without God. Make your financial plans, your own decisions, your dreams that self-effort and hard work will make it happen. You will get, in fact, the American dream. And to this, Solomon says, no, it's not going to happen. No. And he points us to God. God must build the house. Have we not all known couples that marry with barely $5 in their pocket? But they have a vibrant marriage. There's joy in that home and children that are noteworthy. They endure through years of hardship, but they manifest contentment and joy. And others marry well-established financially, but the wealth just kind of slips quickly through their grasp and they lead miserable and even dissatisfied lives. So here you have all the imaginations and plans of man and they guarantee nothing, nothing. Because God breaks down all pride and points us to himself. Some marry for children and they get none. Others marry for none and get them right away. God is the sovereign master of the home. He's the Lord. He breaks our independent, self-reliant plans to bits. Your hard work, your careful planning will be in vain apart from God. Are you building a house? This verse offers both a warning and a comfort. We've already noted the warning. But think of the comfort that it offers. Yes, it costs so much to live in the United States, especially, as we all know, we who live here in Southern California, and some of you others, you know, in your area too. It's so hard even to find the right man or the right woman to marry. It's a huge responsibility to raise and care and provide for children, all the while uncertain how they'll turn out. Life is hard. Life is full of tribulation. 
It takes a lot to make a house. So what? So what? God is greater than any house. He will provide. That's what he's saying. He who sustained the millions of Israelites as they wandered 40 years through a desert, can he not supply your house since he here takes that responsibility upon himself? I mean, think about that. What a comfort is that? God must provide. God will provide. You, Christian, must trust. But in trusting, I say even to the youngins here, don't hesitate to marry. Yes, in time. Run to marriage and run to the responsibility of a family because believing all the while God takes upon himself the responsibility of building your house. Brothers and sisters, what comfort and security these truths have been to me and to my wife Donna in raising our family. We have only nine kids. We're about empty nesters. We have four still at home, right? We're pretty close. We're getting there. And with nine kids, I'm actually an underachiever because my dad and mom had 12 kids, you know? So I just feel that sense of inferiority. Rosemary, Kathy, David, Cindy, Billy, Jimmy, Bobby, Paul, number eight, Janet, Ricky, Chris, Danny. I just have James, David, John, Daniel, Leah, Rebecca, Faith, Elizabeth, and Matthew, underachiever. But with my wife and me, here's our confidence. God will build our house. My house will be established as I trust the Lord to do his work. He does it, and I praise him. It all depends on his blessing and support. Without the Lord, there's no house. With Yahweh, my family will be blessed and confirmed. Now, why should we wonder that it takes so much effort, so much strenuous labor to build a house without the Lord's help? What a horrible path to choose. All the slams on marriage, all the grumbling by spouses and parents, it's because their efforts are self-efforts and they're without the Lord's help. But to those who trust him, there is, we experience peace in adversity, confidence in trial, strength in our tribulations, contentment with the most humble of circumstances because of the Lord. Let the Lord build your house. How will you provide men for your wife, your children? How will you pay for the mortgage or rent, the food, the medical bills? God takes the responsibility of building the family on his own shoulders. Look to him. But notice this, this, this verse does not forbid labor. It doesn't. So here's the other side. It only warns us against vain labor. Because on our part, man must work. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, if anyone will not, what? Work, neither let him eat. Ooh, those are pretty strong words, you gotta admit. And they would radically change this nation if we followed them. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to attend to your own business, and work with your hands, just as we commanded you. Work, and work hard. For the Christian, Colossians 3, 23 and 24, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. And how many times have I quoted the end of this verse to myself? It is the Lord Christ whom you serve, right? So I look over the shoulder of the boss and I know who the real boss is, it's the Lord Jesus. And then that radically changes my conception of what I'm doing. I'm on mission, I'm working for Christ, and it could be the most mundane of things, and I've done them. Worked on an assembly line, assembling boxes, putting fence up around construction sites, driving a coffee truck, truck, whatever it took to get through seminary, right? But you see, when you're on mission, when you're working for the Lord Jesus, that's exciting. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. That's for us as pastors and leaders, of course, true for us too. Well then, as you labor, always work hard, but not to your own ends, but to the glory of God. And as we work, we ascribe all blessing and goodness that we have to him. And remember then, it's not your labors that 
Fill your house. It's the provision of God. You must work, and you must work hard, but remember that he provides as you work, not because of your work. If you ascribe your blessing to your own labors, soon you're gonna be anxious, and you're gonna be proud, and you're gonna be covetous and headed for vanity. Notice the contradiction in life. Some labor night and day and scarcely make ends meet. Others go about life more relaxed, slower in their work, and the wealth pours in. I've met people through the years, so have you. They cannot not make money. Have you ever known people like that? I'm telling you, everything they touch turns to gold. They're always there right at the right time, taking advantage of who knows what, and it always is just amazing to me. Thousands of dollars, you know, and they live for the Lord. But everything depends on the provision of God. Man must work, but it is vain when he worries, depending on his own efforts to sustain himself. There are then these two spheres of responsibility in this verse. There is laboring and there is building the house. Man must labor, that's his job, but God's responsibility is to build the house and he alone has it. And so we can say the task of man is to work. The task of God is to provide. God commanded Adam, he said, Eat his bread in the sweat of his face, Genesis 3.19. Man must work. If he will not work, God will give him nothing. But in his exertion, in his work, he must never depend on his work to sustain him nor attribute the, the results of his efforts to himself. God gives to man as man works, but only because God is good. That's why. So man must busy himself in work, in his job, in his labors, and as he does so, God will bless him and sustain him. So then, brothers and sisters, see this. Note how Solomon solves that deeply troubling problem which perplexes us and aggravates us and keeps us up at night. Don't try to do a task which is God's alone to do. You'll only labor in vain. Labor, but trust him to build your house, and as you labor, he will use your efforts as the guise through which he will bless you. Masked by your work will be his provision. Luther says it so well. If you wanna earn your livelihood honorably, quietly and well, and rightly maintain your household, give heed. Take up some occupation that will keep you busy in order that you can eat your bread in the sweat of your face. Then do not worry about how you will be sustained and how such labor will build and maintain your house. Place yourself in God's keeping. Let him do the worrying and the building. And trust these things to him. He will lay before you richly and well the things which your labor is to find and bring to you. If he does not put them there, you will labor in vain and find nothing. Well said. Now back to our text. Notice now with me the next half of verse one. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. So the lessons we just learned in relation to every household, well now they're applied also to the whole community. For a city, for a state, even a country, is really nothing more than the families or the households combined together. So we have here again a choice for us as human beings. Self-reliance, which produces vain results, or reliance and dependence on God, which he blesses. The most powerful country, the greatest empire, the most potent dynasty can come crashing down in a night. And you know that's a fact because it's in the Bible. Do you remember Daniel chapter five? Belshazzar is slain. Babylon falls, Darius the Mede is enthroned in one night. And later on, talk about Alexander the Great. His kingdom was cut in four immediately after his death, just like that. This world stockpiles weapons, nuclear arms, building up armies, but God watches from heaven and he's unmoved by all of it. Psalm chapter 40, Psalm 40 verse 17 puts it in perspective. All the nations are regarded as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. That's our God. He turns the hearts of kings like channels of water, directing them wherever he wishes. Proverbs 21.1. Don't forget that. 
as you pray for Governor Newsom, Californians. Don't forget that. He watches this world of blind inhabitants as they move ahead in their arrogance without consulting God for direction. And so their plans will fail. Do you remember what those men who built the Tower of Babel said? Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower. God's response, come let us go down and confuse their language. That's who prevails. All the efforts of man will be frustrated and brought to nothing by God unless man looks to him to prosper. Psalm 33, 10, wisely instructs, the Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. Psalm 76, verse 12 proclaims, he will cut off the spirit of princes. He is feared by the kings of the earth. And so all the splendor of the nations, the rise and fall of empires, that is merely God's providential hand acting throughout history. He does always and only as he pleases. Amen? Amen? With the United States, with every other country and empire, he does as he pleases, answering to no man. The city or the nation may do its best to guard itself against attack, buttress its forces, watch, protect, but all is in vain unless the Lord keeps vigilance. The well-being of a country, it's victory in battle, they all depend on the Lord. Now notice, of course, verse 1. It doesn't condemn watchfulness. The watchman must stay awake. He must be vigilant. But this Hebrew perfect verb affirms that what is done by man is ineffectual if the former is not done by God. Again, everything depends on the Lord. The Lord must guard the city as he must build the house. Everything depends on the blessing of God. All prosperity comes from the Lord. That's first letter A, the prosperity of family and state comes from the Lord. And now as we move along in our psalm, here's the next point. Letter B, the prosperity of individuals comes from the Lord. The prosperity of individuals comes from the Lord. Verse 2, it is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. For he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. For the third time now in this psalm, Solomon uses that word, vain. Vain. Vanity of vanities. To build a house without God. To guard a city without God. And now it is vain we are instructed to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. But did you notice in verse 2 that now Solomon gets more personal here? more direct. They in verse one becomes you in verse two. And so men, I wanna to speak to you. Listen, here's the idea. Here's a man in view. He goes off to work earlier than usual. He's getting the jump on the world, he thinks. They're all sleeping. He's off to labor. He comes home late after an unusually prolonged day of work. Literally in Hebrew, he is of late sitting. He's trying to artificially lengthen the natural day. He gets to work early. He delays the sitting down as long as possible. And as we think about this, pastors, we may need to address our congregations and our men directly and say to them, men, God says to you today that if you're doing this, it's in vain. It's not going to bring you the hope to acquire. Maybe you're so worried about the bills, you think that the responsibility of sustaining your family is on your own. Maybe some of you men want far more than just sustenance. You want a bigger house, a nicer car, more toys, more power on the job, or in your ministry, more money. You maybe want to finally have your wife respect you. You need to succeed to feel like a man. If you're not the best at work, you're simply not happy. You need to be always scaling the ladder, whatever price, you'll pay it. And that's where we need to address our men and ask them, are you individually sacrificing your wife or your children for your own success? Ever seen that? When's the last time you threw the ball with your boy or took your little girl out on a date? And more important than your children, when's the last time you had a meaningful talk with your wife? Do you think your wife feels close to you emotionally? You're providing for her physically, but do you have a growing, vibrant, honest, transparent relationship with her? 
Do you remember that really awful question to ask some men? Would she rather be stranded on a desert island with you or her best girlfriend? Ooh, are you your wife's best friend? Why don't you ask her today? See what she says. But be ready because you may be surprised. Maybe she wants you more than your gifts. Maybe she wants you more than the car and house. And are you committing adultery with your job or with your ministry? Is that an idol in your life? Now, there are two, two problems here. First, a lack of trust. God may not provide. I better do it. Go back and rethink yourself through verse 1. You need faith. Secondly, some of you men may have your significance tied up in your job or your ministry. Do we all struggle here? Absolutely. Is that your God? And you have to let it go? Because you can only have one God, the Lord God, who is a jealous God. As you think about that, are you walking with the Lord Jesus? Yes, the grass is greener on the other side because they feed theirs and you're letting yours die. Do you love God? Are you communing with him and reading his word and seeking him? Men, otherwise, look what your hard labors get you. Sorrow. It's vain. What a miserable life of anxiety, of selfishness, competition, independence, exhaustion, but God's not in it. It's all in vain. And if you want to go that route, you will work apart from his blessing. We may just have to warn some even our own men in our congregation. Do you want to wake up divorced with destroyed children and a wrecked life in five or 10 or 15 years? How painful. But you will reap what you sow. Listen to God's way. Proverbs 10, 22. It is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and he adds no sorrow to it. Isn't that great? God makes rich. And there's no sorrow mixed in. And that means, men, we've got to trust him and let him give to us as he pleases. For some, their efforts to get ahead are destroying them and their wife and their kids. And we say, wake up. Because Solomon counsels us here. Don't work beyond your physical and intellectual abilities. Don't go beyond the hours which creation allots you from God in a day, artificially prolonging the day at either end. It, it brings no result of good. Early rising, late retiring, the scholar's midnight oil, they are a delusion, says Solomon. They are a lie. They're vain. They're empty. They're worthless. Work while it's day, and when night comes, go to bed. Just like pastors in Mark 4, we plant the seed of the gospel and we go to bed. Isn't that great? Like, I don't have to worry about what God does with the gospel. He's the Lord. I just plant and I go to bed. You cannot obtain wealth by force from God or your well-devised plans or your unwearied labors. But look at the conclusion of the verse. For he, God, gives to his beloved even in his sleep. That's the New American Standard Bible, and I actually believe that gives the best reading of the Hebrew in the context. Because I believe what Solomon is saying is that God gives more than sleep. He gives in sleep. He gives and he gives to his beloved, the one who is dear to him, you, as you sleep. Okay, now that's totally contradictory to way, the way we normally think. I've got to be doing it. I've got to be earning it. No, says Solomon. You just go sleep. Work, go sleep, and God gives you in your sleep. But do it for the Lord, trusting him to provide under the guise of your labors. He gives. You labor and trust. And then you can sleep quietly on your bed without thinking of anything needed, making any effort to gain it. God will give to you apart from your restless activity. As you renounce yourself and calmly surrender to him, Psalm 46.10, cease striving and know that I am God. Cease striving, let go, relax. The Hebrew has the idea of dropping the hands. Men, can you sleep at night? Or maybe that's a message for your men in your church. Can they sleep at night? 
Think of this promise. What others try to obtain only with wearying toil, constant effort, with so much disappointment and sorrow, God gives to the man whom he loves as he sleeps. Ha! Huh. Wow. Yes, that's it. We're not exempted from the law of labor, but the sting is taken from it when we leave all the results in our Father's hands with absolute trust in his wisdom and goodness. So all the prosperity, all prosperity comes from the Lord. The prosperity of family and state comes from the Lord. The prosperity of individuals comes from the Lord. And lastly, letter C, the prosperity of parents comes from the Lord. The prosperity of parents comes from the Lord. Look with me at verse three. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Behold, it calls attention to what follows. Look, see, see this is true. And the verse literally speaks of sons, but of course it would include daughters. I think the parallelism demands that. The fruit of the womb includes both sons and daughters. So I think he's talking about children, not merely sons. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. Hmm. Okay, now hold on a minute. Let me say it again. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. Now, isn't that quite a thought? God gives the gift of children, even in the United States, where we have disposed of 60 million, 60 million of these precious little ones, babies and we've murdered them since 1973. That's just since 1973. We're in horror at the Holocaust and six million Jews exterminated, genocide, hatred, evil by Adolf Hitler. 10 times that amount in the United States, 60 million. Children are a reward. The idea in the Hebrew is a reward given not because God is duty bound to do so, but it's done freely by him according to his free judgment. The gift is not something that can be demanded. It's in accordance with a promise given by God. That's the idea behind the verse. Children are a blessed gift from above. The fruit of the womb is a reward. It's an inheritance to his favored ones. It is a token of his favor. So I have to ask us, do we really regard children as gifts, as rewards? Now I'm talking to us as Christians. I'll never forget one man I know, he actually got upset with his wife when she told him she was pregnant. How sad is that? I have to ask, why do we so often see children as a heavy burden, as a worry, when God says they're a gift? Can any gift of God not be good? Will he give us a reward which is actually a curse? If children are a reward, why wouldn't we want that reward? Too often, even Christians want to send the gift back to disclaim this inheritance. Spurgeon once wrote this, where society is rightly ordered, children are regarded not as an encumbrance, but an inheritance. And they are received not with regret, but as a reward. But we are a land where in our society, it's not rightly ordered and biblical. Children don't seem to fit in. And sadly, even in some Christian homes. In some cases, we're told begrudgingly how they interfere with ministry. Have you ever been told that by a fellow pastor? My kids get in the way of my ministry. What? They are ministry. Your wife, that's your primary ministry. Your children, that's your second ministry. That's the proving ground of your pastoral ministry. If you fail with your wife and kids, then God's not gonna give you his kids, right? Isn't that true? First Timothy three, start at verse one, read down to verse seven, right? Children do interfere with a life of materialistic pursuits. I can say that with nine. And instead they drive parents to prayer to live in dependence on God for their provision. How terrible is that? I have such great stories to the glory of God. They're not about me or my wife, but just the ways that we've seen God provide last minute. Like the time we drove up to Mariposa with the truck and we didn't have any place to live. We had one lead. I knocked on the guy's door, log cabin. I said, we really need to 
live somewhere. We heard you might be willing to rent your house. He said, yeah, actually I am. When would you like it? I said, right now. And I stepped out of the way and I pointed to the truck. He said, if you will take all of my possessions out of my house and let me use the truck, I will rent you the house right now. So that's literally what we did. We took all of his stuff, put it on the dirt driveway. The church was there. We cleaned his house. We moved our stuff in out of the truck, put his stuff in the truck, and he drove off. I mean, that, you'll never forget something like that. That is just, that's the Lord. It's, it's just that exciting. And I can't say that I have many of those stories, but to live like that, to see how God provides, is absolutely wonderful. Children are a gift. They're a reward. They're an inheritance. But how much, parents and grandparents, are we perhaps playing into the hands of this godless society in our attitudes toward children? Look with me at verse 4. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. And arrows, of course, those would make potent weapons of war in Eastern culture. A soldier with arrows in his hand was ready for combat. They were useful to him, a great help to him. They gave him victory in battle. And note that those are the children of his youth who would later grow up to be a great support and protection to a father. Like Reuben, the children of one's youth were the beginning of a man's strength in the Jewish mind. And such children could grow strong and enjoy life with a still strong father. They could do battle while he too was still ready to fight. And then verse 5 is closely connected. Here in the verse, here's what the NASB says. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They shall not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. How blessed is the man who has many children, says the psalmist. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. What? If we follow worldly thinking, we'd have to say, he's cursed. Paul Phillips, me, He's cursed. I'm cursed. I have all those kids. Who would want that, right? Who's crazy enough? He's crazy. He's chosen one of the worst possible lives. How can he provide for them? What grief? What heartache? And further, who would want a house full of them, right? Are you crazy? In general, regarding children, the message comes through loud and clear. They will mess up your life. They will hinder your ministry. They'll run you around serving them. They will interfere with a self-indulgent American church. So often, that's the real issue. God's word says they're a gift, a reward, and he promises to provide for them, build our families, provide for our needs, but even still, we in America, even the church, some honestly don't really want them. We don't want a quiver full of children. We refuse the reward which other uh, couples would desperately snatch up if they could. Here's Spurgeon again. He writes, those who have no children bewail the fact. Those who have few children see them soon gone and the house is silent and their life has lost a charm. Those who have many gracious children are upon the whole the happiest. Of course, a large number of children means a large number of trials. But when these are met by faith in the Lord, it also means a mass of love and a multitude of joys. Dr. Guthrie used to say, I'm rich in nothing but children. He had 11. Now, as I told you, I myself come from a family of 12 kids. And even though my parents did not know the Lord during my upbringing, mom does now, praise God, at the age of 92. Dad came to Christ the last year of his life at 75. What fond memories I have of brothers and sisters. I have six brothers. I have five sisters. And what a joy to have in all of those years of my upbringing, never did we lack bread. And I have such fond memories of people and not necessarily things or objects. Children are a, a blessing. A full quiver is a blessing. And so I got to tell you, personal testimony, even before I married Donna, as I studied through passages like this, I became convinced and I started to pray, God, give me a full quiver. I want this blessing. When my wife, when we were dating, found out about that, she went away and cried the whole night, right? She has one sister, okay? So that was pretty radical. And I got to tell you, through the years, it was praying as God brought one at a time for us to be ready and for God to provide. Now, to our young people, I have to ask in light of Psalm 27, don't you want that blessing? See, someone's got to say it to you because there it is, right? And maybe your parents are. Maybe your pastor is. 
If you don't want that blessing, why not? Maybe that's a completely different perspective, but I've lived this and I can attest to the blessings and joys of children. And nearly 10 years ago, I learned something that makes the message of verse five even stronger. The New American Standard Bible translation says, to read it again, how blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. But then, about 10 years ago, I came across the ESV translation, and here it is. Some of you have the ESV. Raise your hand with ESV, okay? Ooh, it's much stronger than that. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Do you see that? Raise your hand if you read that in your ESV. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. That's a more active sense. He's actually taking steps to fill his quiver with children. He's pursuing a quiver full. And I said, which is the correct translation? The New American Standard Bible or the more active sense of the ESV? And the answer is the ESV. It's, it's a better translation. I remember writing my Hebrew prof at the master's seminary, Dr. Barak, I asked him, and he wrote back that this Hebrew verb here in the PL is best taken the way the ESV translates it. The same kind of construction is seen in Jeremiah 51, 34. It's the only other occurrence of this combination in the Hebrew Bible of the verb plus the preposition min. You have the verb followed by the object of what he fills, then what the object is filled with. So then Solomon is teaching us on behalf of God that the man who actively fills his quiver with children is blessed, is happy. Wow, that's the life of blessing and happiness for a married man, a father, actively pursuing a quiver full of children. A Christian man then will be a lover of children, will pursue the blessing of children, filling his quiver with them through a Christ-honoring marriage and family. Wait, 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 someone says. Don't you know the world is overpopulated as it is? Don't encourage people to have more babies. This has been the message we've heard in the West for over 250 years. It started with a guy named Thomas Malthus. He lived from 1766 to 1834. He was an English economist and priest. In his essay on the principles of population, 1798, he argued that human populations grow faster than the supply of food, and that unless population growth is artificially controlled, this leads to poverty and an increased death rate. And his ideas had an important influence on Charles Darwin, by the way, and eugenics. In 1798, Thomas Malthus published an essay on the principles of population. He wrote this, the power of population is so superior to the power of the earth to produce subsistence for man that premature death must in some shape or other visit the human race. The vices of mankind are active and able ministers of depopulation. They are the precursors in the great army of destruction and often finish the dreadful work themselves. But should they fail in this war of extermination, sickly seasons, epidemics, pestilence, and plague advance in terrific array and sweep off their thousands and tens of thousands. Should success be still incomplete, gigantic, inevitable famine stalks in the rear and with one mighty blow levels the population with the food of the earth. And ever since then, we have been told that the world would be richer and happier if we only had less children, baby banning. It's definitely in. The overpopulation scare, it's like so much of the other baggage that's left over from the 1960s. Maybe you heard of a guy named Paul Ehrlich. He wrote his book, The Population Bomb. You know what he told us? In the world, it's running out of food, it's being depleted of natural resources, the world is overpopulated, and we're running out of land fast. We gotta do something fast. Is the world overcrowded? This is a destructive myth. It's been used to justify abortion, sterilization, infanticide, euthanasia, the supposed need for planned parenthood, and countless UN agencies to fix our problems of overpopulation. Actually, the world is relatively empty. And let me prove it to you. There are actually 52.5 million square miles of land area in the world, and that's not even including Antarctica. But guess what? The entire population of the earth could easily be put into the state of Texas, and comfortably so. Let me show you this. 
The landmass of Texas, 268,820 square miles. Let's keep the math simple. Let's use the population of the Earth of 7 billion. So here we have 268,820 uh, square miles in Texas. Divide that by 7 billion people. You will have a plot of land approximately 33 feet by 33 feet for every single person on the planet. That's enough room for a townhouse. Given an average family of four, that would mean every family in the world would get a plot of land 60 feet, 66 feet by 66 feet. You could comfortably provide a single family home and yard all in the state of Texas. Do you see the point? Well, we'd all want to be Texans anyway, right? They, they think so. Further, is the world running out of vital natural resources? No. What has been discovered in time is that as the Earth population grows, technology also grows with it, creating new products, fuel sources, the use of existing or often overlooked resources in new ways, for example, fracking in the United States. And further, significant progress has been made in land reclamation, tapping the vast resources of the oceans, the synthesis of any number of products in the laboratory. So we're not running out of land or resources or food. God commanded Adam and Eve and their descendants, that's us, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So go forth, multiply, fill the earth. So says God, our creator and Lord. We can obey him, confident in his wisdom and provision. And this command has never been rescinded. It repeated in Genesis 9. And that is God's command. Do it, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And God gave us the privilege of eating meat, Genesis 9. Other animals, eat them to your heart's content. I am an omnivore, but especially a carnivore, right? Drill for oil, use the other resources of the earth. It is rich in resources, our world is. And see those as a gift from God. Praise him for them. Trusting him for our provision and care. Be wise stewards, yes, but live out scripture, not false religion and fear-mongering, apocalyptic predictions made by those who hate God and worship nature. In Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 to 22. Thank you for hanging in there with me. We're only going to go another hour. Okay, here we go. Genesis 8, 20 and 22. Just kidding. Half hour. No, not that. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. This is now Genesis 8, 21. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night will not cease. So here's post-flood. God is restoring the confidence in this subdued world under God's control and promise where they could again thrive and prosper. God pledges himself to the earth and its inhabitants with the intention of blessing them as long as the earth remains. There will be seed time and harvest due to God's dominion over the earth. There is no mother earth, of course, in biblical thinking. God rules, guaranteeing the seasons, the fertility of the earth, there will be planting and harvesting while the earth remains, and so says God. So the earth owes its powers and its productivity to God and his command and his faithfulness to provide as Lord of the earth and the universe, and he will overall guarantee and regulate predictable environmental patterns, planting, harvest, because he's good and he's kind and he provides for us as his creatures as the supremely wise and gracious Lord, the almighty sovereign, the God of providence. We don't need to fear over population and the radical apocalyptic doomsday predictions of people who hate God. Just trust God, his provision, his estimation of children. They're a blessing, a reward, a gift from God. Now, before I leave this issue of supposed overpopulation, I have to tell you that the evidence points strongly in the exact opposite direction. Did you know that? Underpopulation. This is what's happening. In other words, many countries in our world are moving toward dying out. They are literally killing themselves off because they're not having children. And when they do conceive, they often abort by the millions all over the world. Birth rates, just go on the internet, check this out. Birth rates are drastically falling to alarmingly low rates. And that means you need 2.1 children per family to 
have the present adult generation simply reproduce itself. It's called the replacement rate, the replacement rate. But our world is entering what's been called an uncharted territory in demographic history. Listen to these birth rates, 2.1 needed. South Korea, 1.0. Japan, 1.4. Italy, 1.3. Germany, 1.6. Ukraine, 1.3. Canada, 1.5. USA, 1.7. France, 1.9. So many of these populations like our own are propped up by immigration, but the fact is the major countries of the world are not having babies. They are depopulating themselves. And this is called now a death spiral. It's happening all over the world. And demog uh, demographic specialists are saying, can we even recover from this? Is it possible to pull out of these death spirals? Pierre Chenu, a noted French demographer, he called it the strangest collective suicide of history. We're just killing ourselves off. So think of it. The economic implications for many nations are so far reaching. How much longer can a shrinking workforce keep up payments for an increasing number of persons requiring retire re retirement benefits? Will the tax paying young pressure to do with the so-called useless eaters as Hitler referred to the aged and infirm. Christian scholar Harold O.J. Brown once pointed out that the millions of babies aborted since 1973, those babies would not have increased unemployment, would have produced a vastly greater consumer demand. Now it's 60 million Americans missing. Think about that. He asks, this is really what got to me in seminary and got me thinking about this whole thing. Harold O.J. Brown, one article, he asks this, should not Christians trusting in God have the necessary confidence to reproduce in number, showing the world the value of children? Could we not show a materialistic culture the value of children over things, possessions, stockpiles of goods to be used for self-indulgent gratification? Could we not model a life of faith and trust over selfishness and covetousness? Could we not proclaim the blessing of children and a life lived under the providence of God? Could we not significantly impact our country and world by raising up large godly families to be the next generation of witnesses on behalf of Jesus Christ? I never thought that way, even with 11 brothers and sisters until seminary and I first started to think about it. At the end of verse five, they will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. The father with his sons, his children will stand in adversity they will meet their enemies in the gate where battle would normally be waged with enemies striving to capture a city and the result will be victory. Parents and children stand together in adversity and are not overawed. Now, of course, today we don't literally fight enemies in the gate, but certainly we face trials and persecutions and the family, blessed by God, stands strong together in the face of that attack and adversity and difficulty. They will not be ashamed. They will stand in adversity against the enemies in the gate. Do we esteem children? Do we see them as a blessing? Do you long for this inheritance? Joseph Hall, a pastor of old, relates a story. He says, I remember a great man coming into my home at Waltham, seeing all my children standing in the order of their age and stature. He said this, these are they that make rich men poor. But he straight received this answer, nay, my Lord, these are they that make a poor man rich. For there is not one of these whom we would part with for all your wealth. Let's pray. All prosperity comes from the Lord. The prosperity of family, state, individuals, parents. May we learn to trust him and walk with him and work with him for his glory. Our Father in heaven, tonight we rejoice in the Lord Jesus, in his death on our behalf, the just one for us, the unjust, to bring us to you. We've been reconciled to you. We've been changed, radically changed forever. The Spirit of God brought the new birth, and we repented, and we believed, and we were saved, and forgiven, and declared righteous, and adopted, and given an inheritance with all the saints in light, and made partakers of the Holy Spirit. And we so desire for him to continue to make us like Jesus Christ, to have a rich harvest of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And we are learning to depend on you as God, our Father. 
not relying on ourselves, but trusting in you, Lord, with all of our heart and not leaning on our own understanding. In all of our ways, acknowledging you that you would make our paths straight. And so, Father, may we take courage from your word to trust you and your provision and your grace. Thank you for our families. Thank you for our wives and our children and for some of us, even grandchildren. And with our families, our marriages, our parenting, how we desire and pray that they would be God-centered and Christ-focused, that we would make much of Christ. And may you be merciful and save our children and our grandchildren, and may we be light in the midst of the darkness. May we shine the light of Christ. May we shine like stars in the midst of a perverse and wicked generation. And all this to the glory of the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.